Good morning, everyone. Today is Saturday, November 5th, 2022. My name is Barbara With, and you are here with me and the party of 12, who are, well, first of all, quite a bit more than 12. And secondly, yeah, it is a big party up there. And for those of us who have been working with them for all this time, uh, I can speak for many of us when I say it gives us comfort to know that's where we're going. <laughs> so today, I was going to come without anything on the agenda, but then when I sat down to record, I thought, you know what I want to talk about? I want to talk about worry. Because worry is is a great equalizer. And in this day and age, there is a whole lot to worry about. But even in good times, we all suffer from this needless expense of our precious energy. So today we're going to talk about that with the psychic sorority who are around the corner. And uh, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the party. Um, there is a church in Duluth that I've talked about and talked at for many years. The Lake Superior Interfaith Community Church started out as a spiritualist church back in 1998 when they came to our book signing in Duluth for our book, Diaries of a Psychic Sorority. And uh, they've invited me back ever since. I've done workshops, I sing, I, I speak. And I recently started after COVID going back to speak and offered to do a conflict revolution workshop in person, which is the first thing. I haven't done one of those in a long time in person. And it turns out the new president of the board is a visionary and Lake Superior Interfaith Community Church will be the headquarters for conflict revolution. We're going to get it out to our political leaders. We're going to get it into the schools. We're going to fabulous. I know. I I'm I'm I wish Debbie were here because she, she was the one that was saying last spring, I see it. It's going to be in the schools. It's going to be in the government. <laughs> and so to hear Carolyn Sheets talk to me yesterday on the phone, I I hung up and I was just like, oh my God, here we go. That's awesome. Good for you. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really happy about that. And um, I was going to come today with just sort of an open agenda. And then as soon as I sat down to sort of prepare myself, you know, I take a couple hours before to put things together. And I just thought, I want to talk about worry. Not that I've been worrying a lot lately. In fact, I would say I probably worry 87% less than I did say 20 years ago. But I think in this time, there's a, and there's a lot of levels of worry. And then there's a lot of multiple things to worry about. So I thought maybe we could, we could chat about that before we go into a, a reading. So worry. To feel uneasy about something uncertain or threatening matter, to be troubled, to pull, bite, or tear at something, to work under difficulty or hardship, to struggle, to cause to feel anxious, distressed, troubled, to bother, to annoy, to grasp and tug at repeatedly like a dog worrying about a bone to toy with, to touch, press, or handle idly. The act of worrying or the condition of being worried, mental uneasiness and anxiety. See synonyms at anxiety. I, I started to think about how these conversations we've been having and Lynn, you sharing your struggles with trying to stay in compassion and me sharing that, you know, I've got this side of me that comes out wagging her finger and you know, having all this thing. And it, it, it occurred to me that, that all of that is a form of worry. What, whoever that per, woman is in me who has to be telling off the oil company executives, you know, in her kitchen, <laughs> It's a it's like a form of worry. I started thinking about this process that we have that so is perfectly addresses it. It perfectly addresses it. Not that it's easy to do, but these really practical steps 
are there in a really hard time, generally it's very difficult to get a hold of yourself when you're in those attachment of worry or the atta attachment of that anxiety. I went to the uh, dispensary. One of the receptionists said, if it wasn't for the dispensary, I wouldn't even be able to stand here and have this job and be able to converse with you because my anxiety levels are so high that I would just like run out of a supermarket with my, leave my cart half filled. And, and now that I have the dispensary, <laughs> I, I can, I can cope and I can do this. And I understand that uh, effect that what they sell at the dispensary has on anxiety and have experienced that myself too. But I thought how sad that you have to be that way when if you gave me enough time, we could teach you how to transform your worry and transform your anxiety, like repeated conscious steps that you can take that over time will reduce it by 87%. For the best that I can do in my life, I have really reduced so much of that. Now, maybe that's time too. And being this age, you don't worry so much as you did 20 years ago, but I really do credit the day-to-day -day ability today to be able, when I'm in those anxious places, to walk myself out of it. I think it's not, are they gone? Do you get them anymore? If you get them, then you failed. No, it's what processes of self-love and self-care do we have in place that we are going to call upon to address what's going on in the system? Would you say that worry is usually or maybe always future-oriented? That's a good question. What do you think? I think yes. Most of the time, if not all, you're worried about something that will happen, will go wrong, will um, affect you negatively in some way from your perception. You know, based on past things, perhaps you're worried things will continue the way they were that you didn't like, or... If there's a trauma in the past that has us attached to it, in my life, it was always the trauma of my father so I, I don't know if it would be worry, but it would certainly be anxiety. Anxiety is different from worry, in my opinion. And of course, German medicine has a, German healing knowledge has a, a stance on that. Anxiety is a combination of feeling powerless and feeling like something's coming at you from the front and you can't step out of the way. Different from something, something coming at you from behind that you don't see. And then, you know, that's a different shock. But it's a combination, the anxiety attacks in particular, come from that combination of conflicts. If you can correct one of them, then you're out of it. Like if you can deal with the powerlessness, do something to feel more powerful or to something to step out of the way of whatever you're you know, concerned about, then you're out of that constellation, if you were. I think worry can maybe lead to anxiety. I, I don't think worries, uh, for me, worries not as, intense or deep as anxiety well maybe is worry the result of anxiety is 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 worry that because anxiety isn't wouldn't we say anxiety is emotion well so is worry isn't it well worry seems to me to be an intellectual activity oh okay. right if we're worrying about the future like you're saying you know and I, I, I don't disagree about what why would you worry about the past I mean the past is over but if you've done something in the past that you're worried is going to be exposed or is going to cause you some whatever but in the definition you read barb um the last thing you said was mental uneasiness and anxiety under the definition for worry so worry itself is isn't an emotion it's a, it's a, it's a mental activity. I think that maybe that's the result of the anxiety, anxiety, a state of uneasiness or distress about future uncertainties, apprehension, worry, a cause of uneasiness, 
intense fear or dread lacking an unambiguous cause or a specific threat. So it's all, it's all, it's kind of a state maybe more than is it emotion or is it this or that? It's a state to be in. Anxiety. Yeah. Which is, you know, they they seem to be synonymous anxiety and worry in whatever that, but I do, I do feel them as different things as well. When we study Jinshin, Lynn and I, and I, I study it for a long time, but we study it together as well. Um, the releasing of the fingers deals with the different, they would say emotions. So, so the thumb is worry. And there's a little, what do you call it when there's a saying that you, helps you remember what, <laughs> what you're dealing with. So get rid of worry fast. So worry, fear, F for fear, A for anger, anger, <laughs> um, yeah. that one, and, and uh, fast, S for sadness or grief is the ring finger. Yes, thank you. And the small finger is trying too hard, efforting, trying. Efforting. So get so fast, T is trying too hard in, the, in that little saying. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that we do that a lot, I think. We try, I do anyway, or used to try too hard, over care of others, you know, various ways that you, you know, you strive to accomplish or be better or something instead of just being okay with what is and loving who you are. I, I do that, both hands. When I go to bed, I do it when I wake up during the night, I do it when I get up in the morning and just you feel a little pulse about eventually just hold each. Just it, you're holding them. Holding, yeah, holding in the other hand, your thumb, then your index finger, and you fall asleep half the time, you know, while you're doing it, I do. Wow, interesting. Each finger, apparently, I don't know how anybody ever ascertained this, but is associated with 14,400 different bodily functions. So all 10 make 144,000. Now, don't ask me how anybody came up with that, but <laughs> we'll have to verify those facts. Yes, yes. A lot of these things came from beyond through people, as we know, that happens a lot. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So this this was a um, Asian fellow that kind of reinvigorated an old form of energy work from the past supposedly healed himself and then spread the word again. So, so twice I went to Colorado to study that. That teacher's now in Oregon, but I've seen it work dramatically. Like sometimes instantly, like you're worried or you're fearful and, and you, and then it's gone. One time it, it worked so fast, I thought, wow, now I don't feel anything. I'd rather feel something with my, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it was interesting. And I've had other people say the same. But it's an easy, handy thing you can do. And it's like redirecting. When I've had panic attacks, my mind didn't shut off. Well, it kind of did. I mean, the panic attack I had at the airport during all those bad years where I was just standing there and you get these kind of like a squirrel thing and you can't breathe and stuff. So that's below the thinking process. While all that's going on, the thinking process is saying, oh my God. God, people are going to think I'm insane. What? I can't get a grip. Yeah, the judgments. <laughs> yeah, the projection of judgments uh, upon upon ourselves. Right. And it, in terms of this too, I was during those years uh, where I was um, really addressing some deep mental disturbances and trauma from my youth. I went to see my friend in Portland to help her out with some things. And she had just come from like two weeks of sitting in silence and some Buddhist two weeks. And she, as soon as she got out of that door with that cell phone in her hand, she called me and said, this is just like our work. <laughs> it's like, so while I was there and going through all my anxiety and such, she taught me the, the scan just the head scan, just do, just make it to the toes. And because I was flying home and a captive audience in a, a seat, when I got out on my connection, I was like, really? Nothing gave me relief. Like that had given me relief up until that time too. So. Yeah, it's all energy. 
mm, rebalancing or helping it flow because it's stuck, it's trapped sort of. So you're just keeping it. So I, like I said, I just do that automatically whether I feel anxious or not, which I don't most of the time. I just do it because the more you do it, the better it works is the other thing. The effects are cumulative. So it just, it's a good idea in my opinion to just keep doing it. Uh, well, yeah. and speaking of reduced worry, having you and I having worked together for a long time now, I can say that I've seen you reduce your worry quite a bit since I first oh, met yeah. you, just beautifully. Sure. Well, and then the boys grew up too. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother passed as well. Yeah, right. <laughs> Those certain things happen, but yes, but I would have to catch myself and not attach my worry to them to know that they'll be okay whatever it looks like like their path is their path kind of thing easier said than done of course and you know they always used to say we know it's impossible not to worry about your kids but you know downgrade it as much as you can and it, it certainly helps I like what you said too about how does that worry affect that that situation and I've often thought of that too with my anger because anger was a really big thing for me and I would get angry and focus it on that thing and later thought, what am I doing? What, how am I influencing that? Uh, if we could see the energy, I think we would behave differently. <laughs> we could actually see the, you know, the colors, the direction, you know, maybe some people can. Um, yeah. We used to do that hands of like Barbara Ann Brennan or something. Like yes. She, he could see right through people, see their skeletons, see, you know. So she was using her her skills, her talents. Who is this? Barbara Brennan. Barbara Brennan. Okay. I, I did some. I did a a workshop with her in Denver, and it was really, really quite phenomenal. And yes, there's so much to do with energy all of the time. If we tune in to the fact that that energy is constantly there, and wanting to serve us, whether, whether we're trying to block it or whatever we're doing, because being a reflexologist and being a Reiki practitioner, we know everything, so much is energy. This week has been a very interesting week for me. I have been become very, very aware of a lot of the things that I've been talking about with you, with you ladies, working because I'm a work in progress, <laughs> working on letting it all just go. And this detachment was a really biggie. So this week, finally succumbing to this, having done so well, even though Scott had been so sick and I hadn't gotten it. And then uh, when I finally came down with it, it was like, okay, what were we just talking about? Let go, let go, let go. I am letting go. <laughs> detach, detach, detach and let go. And it feels to me like that's what's happening. Not panicking, not having an anxiety attack over what's going on, just looking at it, observing, and you know, this being thankful thing <laughs> is a little bit tricky. Being thankful when we don't feel good, you know, uh, uh, this has slowed me down. And I've thought about a lot about what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. And, and it's really, I think it's, no, I don't just think, I know it's helping me. Going through that conflict revolution process to look at myself and where is my part in every bit of this, you know? And it's been big. And, and through all of the different modalities and things that I've studied off and on over the years in trying to help myself, and they all have, by the way, they've all done their own little parts and I kind of um, forgotten about some of the really phenomenal healings that I had through that, those processes. It's, it's an awakening as well. And you know, we're, we're awakening into a new humanity, a new way of doing things. And I think it's difficult to um, make these steps, but for me, I know I have to let go, hang it, of the, the baggage and the garbage and the stuff that needs to come out to make room for the new that wants to come in. Well yeah. said. 
if we can be grateful for all of that baggage and garbage and thank it on, you know, bless it or incorporate it or release it or whatever we're doing and see everything as an opportunity. Like you, Joanne, I don't, I don't worry like I used to worry. And like you, Linda, just said, this new habit that I have of consciously saying, let it go, let it go. Like if I have to do it 25 times a day, because I start to get attached to if I'm going to work at this place, but what if I don't let it go, let it go. It gets more and more to where I can think all those years that I thought I was suffering. I mean, I probably was really suffering, but today that was the richness of of being where I am. I'm so grateful for 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 that suffering. What a rich life I've lived, you know. Starting our second lives, our new lives. Yes, our new lives, and and just that we can have these conversations are creating the new humanity, right? And that we're living this way. We're so awesome. <laughs> yes, we are. And we're way ahead of our time, but uh, it doesn't matter because these conversations are timeless. What are, what is time? Yes. This is the human condition. I have a phrase that I came up with in a letter to a friend that went like this. I am truly a full spectrum experiential human. I love that. The um, the minister at the church, the visionary minister, Carolyn Sheets, is severely ADD. And I'm I'm pretty good at spotting anybody who has any kind of autistic spectrum ADD because I don't care one little bit. I totally get them and I totally get it. So being in her presence, I picked that up. But when she called me, she had this phrase about, she said, I, I'm really going to be honest with you. I'm severely ADD and I have to take care of myself. I have to make decisions and be honest with people and say no to them. So I don't overbook and all that stuff. But I'm asking you to partner with me on this. <laughs> I said, I will absolutely partner with you on your ADD. Yes. So I thought that was again, an, another reframing of essentially I think is an anxiety and a worry when ADD makes you run out of the grocery store or you can't function because of it. It's there's some kind of worry in there. Oh, but we, we, we categorize everything. And so what if those people considered AD, ADD and ADHD, okay, are on another wavelength and get their energy in a different way. And we just want them to be compartmentalized into society's normalcy. I don't know if it's that I want her to be in her normalcy. I want her to be, ha I want her to be happy and thriving. I don't want her to be living in anxiety where she has to run out of a grocery store because she's so afraid. Okay. All right. But I totally agree with what you said about that. You know, being ADHD myself, I've just developed a different methodology of, having six or seven projects going at once throughout a day and training myself to be able to bounce from one to the other. And at the end of the day, I've got them done, but everybody can't do that. You right. know, everybody who's ADD or ADHD can't, there's, uh, there's what you say in their heads, I think, where, oh, you can't do it that way because we're supposed to fit into, you know, being able to do it this way. So in my undergrad, in my forties, which was in the 90s, this whole ADD and ADHD thing hit, you know, the media and everything. And I was seen as ADD or ADHD, whatever it was. So I did what I do. I delved into research to find out what it was all about. And I was able to behavior modify. I found the information useful. And then I was able to behavior modify at each step of the way and came back with saying, well, if this is a condition, then it's something that I've been able to change. Is it a condition or is it something that we are labeling behaviors that in we, what we need to be doing is empowering people in ways to be in the world that they find themselves in 
in a positive way. You know, the one that was really noticeable for me was body language. I had really not ever taken note of body language. And I read a whole thing on it. And I was fascinated. Yours? No, people around me. I work at such a high mental velocity that it just wasn't, it wasn't in my, I don't know, it, it just didn't catch for me. But once I knew about it, got it fascinating. It became a real fascinating subject. And the idea of labeling and putting things in a, a box that, you know, labels are so sure of. Um, when there is the opportunity, if one wants to. Yeah, I, I agree. And I I always used to say that I don't, I would never have labeled myself anything, but I have experienced the conditions that go. are described in those labels. Uh, so ADHD is a condition that's modifiable. I mean, well, you've proven it. I've proven it. It's modifiable. Everything is. Everything. Right. Right. So is it a condition or, I mean. Well, it's a temporary condition until you modify it one way or the other. So even understanding what people mean by it, like because your attention deficit disorder and you can add in the hyperactive, that probably doesn't make you run out of a store in fear. That's something else. If somebody has multiple conditions yes. that they experience, which is what I took her yeah. the lady at the dispensary she had multiple conditions and most people do <laughs> right time, how many active conflicts are we dealing with at a time generally and the answer was 10 just on average 10 we've got things going on we're in the healing phase of one we're in the active phase of another and then something else happens but we can do that we do do that all the time and it makes us who we are and it opens things up for us it's not a bad thing so going back to Linda, who is now under the covers and having this thing, that's the healing phase of the resolution of the conflict. You you express this transformation that you feel like you're going through because okay. of this conscious effort to let go. Yes. And, and I then, feel that way. And so now it's letting go out of your body. And I and, feel lighter. I feel kind of like weight's been kind of lifted off my shoulders so to speak i've had two anxiety attacks by the way both been in within the last six years uh not, nothing just real recently but i was trying to think back if i could even remember what the trigger was when it hit it was like i could not breathe i couldn't breathe at all i couldn't take a breath and I have a neighbor that's had a couple, two or three of them ended up in the hospital. She was driving her car when one hit, literally. I mean, oh, just stopped right in the middle of the road. She's an ex-police person. And I, I was kind of trying to think back, where did these come from for her out of nowhere in a way? But that's not true. They didn't come from nowhere because I think they might be the, uh, the culmination of the little anxieties the little um, things we're talking about subconsciously, possibly, and maybe more than one layer of subconsciousness, maybe way down deep in our subconscious, the impact of it trying to, I don't know if it's trying to get out of us. I, ca I cannot think back to what was the trigger. You know, it, it was like it just came from nowhere. I, I used to be a very severe asthmatic. That's what brought me onto this path was my own physical health. I just got more ill, more what, more whatever it was to the point of just asking God, the universe, whatever, to show me a way to help myself. And that's what brought me on this path. Many years ago, and I, I was able to stop a full-blown asthma attack in less than three minutes and get off all my meds. I'm not gonna say I'm backpedaling, but I kind of forgot some of the things that he helped heal me, that that brought me to where I am am today. And I think a lot of this is coming up for me right now. And it's not about me uh, letting go of those things, but remembering things that really did help. And 
going back and using some of them again. I'm using the reflexology. I'm using I'm using the Reiki. I'm 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 using a little bit of all of a sudden all of these things that I have used in the past. I'm using a little bit of each one of them, the knowledge that each one of them gave me, and remembering to use them. That, I think that must be uh, part of that whole mystery school awakening energy that they talked about within us. We're now remembering the things, like you said, from this life, from from that life, from the lives where we were actively engaged. I listened to that channel from the last week and it was, they said the difference was back when we were actually in the mystery schools, we were incredibly connected to nature. And so this time it's bringing that back into a world that maybe is a little dis dis disconnected from nature. Not just a little. I think that's the best question though, or the best focus. How can I help myself? Show me how I can help myself. What can I do for myself now? The best thing. That's been my big motivation for everything I've studied actually. What is that? place inside us because that's that moment where we pick up our power it's like what is that thing that's going to turn people is it like debbie said last week where we just get so bad off <laughs> that we have to change or i think that happens for some people for sure so my previous husband was attached to being rescued and his 11 siblings did a great job of that and it was a behavior that never got addressed because there was always someone there to catch him, always someone to bail him out financially, to, you know, do whatever. And I just use that as an example I was, you know, close to, but there is this piece of some people get attached to or kind of fall into a coping role, which is some of the childhood trauma stuff is that people in their adult lives all of a sudden, or some of them not, but in some cases, we can look at what that trauma was and see where it, coping mechanisms from that stage in life are impacting my life right now, and then I wanna change it. But if you don't wanna change it, you don't see it, you aren't there. I mean, listening to you, Linda, was like listening to music. <laughs> it was just so, you know, if you wanna think of, for me, it's the fact that we are talking about this. It is out there. We are putting it out there more and more in the ethers and so on and so forth. We are having these conversations. You know, it's time and it's beautiful. And yes, there's still the layers of the onion and the things that, that come back. A lot of things that I've used over the years were stepping stones. And then occasionally there's something I go back to. But I'm always amazed at how the accumulation of any sort of methods or experiences or workshops or conferences that have to do with my growth become not even a memory. They're just an experience that moved me to the next place. Let's go into a channel and I'm sure the party will have good things to say as well. Let's take a few deep breaths. And exhale and release all of the tension, all the worry, all the anxiety. And as you inhale deeply, deep down into your solar plexus, gather up any energy that isn't serving you, needs to be cleansed needs to be purged. And we want you to settle your consciousness into a unified field. So when you feel the unified field of the dimension of emotion, you don't feel each individual emotion. If you experience the unified field of emotion, you are experiencing at one time 
everything that a human being has the capacity to feel as far as their connection to the source. In that emotion is the entire spectrum of color as well. From the deepest, hottest reds to the coolest ices. In that spectrum of emotion comes the senses. All of the senses. So when you have an opportunity to feel the unified field of emotion, what you're feeling is pure power. And we will command that only the most divine light shine down upon us at this time and that the greatest good be present here. One of the most important lessons that every human being shares is about their relationship to their own personal power. This is a lesson that begins at birth, in your first awakening moments out of the watery womb and into this finite, harsh, bright, noisy environment. You are bombarded, your senses, your hearing. Imagine going from being underwater for nine months to suddenly bursting into the physical world, into a hospital room where people are talking and there's buzzers and the, the place that you just left is actually a human who's crying and sobbing and struggling. That transition is the moment when the experiments begin, when the awareness begins to arise of relationships, of if you cry, you get food. And that is one of the first mathematical equations that you learn. And it's also the beginning of this multi-leveled experience of human life. Layers and layers complex systems upon complex systems that start out in this very simple form this, with this very simple equation. If I cry, then I get fed. And then you learn if you get fed, you feel better. Your body feels better. When your body doesn't feel good, then you cry again. We bring this metaphor up because if you're dealing with transforming any kind of behavior, we began with the discussion of worry because worry and anxiety encompass so much of behavioral conditions. This is about the evolution of human consciousness, which you volunteered and were chosen to be a part of this grand research project with us, where you are choosing to be conscious and communicative from that place of the consciousness of your consciousness. That's a commitment that all humans are coming around to being until each individual gets to that place where they turn that corner because things are so bad or uncomfortable or that crying is no longer getting you food. So these kinds of transformations are possible in many, many more situations than humans deduce. We were talking to you, our research project, who have committed to being conscious of their consciousness and communicating about it. So you have a jump up on the general population of the planet right now, although there are millions and millions and millions and millions of people like you doing very, very, very similar, if not exacting things that we're doing with you here. When you tap into that synergy, you begin to understand how your little bit of individual power can actually hold as much power as God has in the palm of your hand. You can bring life, you can take life. 
right now is this time where people like yourselves are catching up to that fact and are remembering and opening up and realizing that not just the trainings or the workshops or the conferences or the books or the other people, the other experts that you've trained from, but from your other life experiences in this life, the tragedies you might have experienced as children, all of that is a, a, an incredible amount of data and learning experience that you have that you can utilize. And what's so interesting is that for a human being who has been brought up, maybe traumatized, experiencing trauma, and it, it doesn't even have to be that everyone was beaten and hurt. There's different kinds of trauma that come up in everyday situations due to a human being's personality, what they've brought in with them to achieve in this life and to to be challenged by in this life. There's all kinds of ways to be traumatized. Trauma from different lives that doesn't make any sense because you haven't lived a traumatized life. So there's a lot that goes on in every single human being. At some point for humanity in its evolutionary step to survive, enough of you come to this consciousness of consciousness, come to making these decisions of your free will to change your life taking your life as a sacred piece of God to be loved and utilized for the good of all, to dedicate your lives to utilizing this life that you have been gifted with as a miracle to help evolve the planet for seven generations to come. That great awakening that's going on right now is so much more powerful than you'll see in your daily life. And that's why we want to come to you as much as possible once a week to remind you of that. And every time that you come together and you share your stories and you share your sorrows and your triumphs and you each learn from the synergy that's going on, that's a huge amount of energy between four, three, four, five of you. You're changing each one of you is changing with that support. And that's what we said when we began at the beginning of the year, when we wanted to do this on a regular basis for you, to give you the support, to bring you together. As you've said, your work is timeless. This information is just the beginning of what's going to be able to be passed on to generations. And soon, like all of those books that you talked about earlier in the season, the books and the videotapes of the various trainings and the conferences that you give away because you did it and you incorporated it into your energy and it is there for you to accept and awaken to, to remember and to unify in everything and own and, and be grateful for as a gift. So it's almost like you have this huge power plant. And every time you come across a memory that had been suffering and you reframe it into being that gift of wisdom, you add to the power plant, you add to the battery cell. The more that you do this awakening, the more you're going to spend in intention. The more time you're going to spend when you're frustrated or triggered, that you're going to channel that trigger of emotion into an intention for the greatest good, whatever that looks like. That's the new humanity. That's the new humanity that's being birthed. The fact that we have this extraordinary opportunity to be with you, to work with you behind the scenes, to come together with you on a regular basis to help support your search for that strength. Because this work you're doing is a laser focus into the future of creating that new humanity. You're doing it now, it's in the present, but you're affecting generations to come.
for that, you can be grateful for every last breath that you've taken in every last life that you've had, because that world, that world knows no, no bounds. That world is a world where people do disconnect and reconnect with nature again and with the human hearts and with community. And sometimes it takes losing in order to build anew. When you find yourself worrying, it's a very simple process. Hard to do, but it's very simple. Separate your thoughts from your feelings and take a breath. And if your feelings are on your right side, you're holding them in your right hand and your thoughts are in your left hand, and you take that breath, Feel that energy moving down both arms and exchanging energy. And as you exhale, you exhale out the emotion, you exhale out the thought, and you just be in the I am. And this is not something you have to do for hours at a time. It's something you do instantaneously for a second or two. And the power that that second or two has is so much greater than the power of worrying, than the power of projection, than the power of denying your feelings. Be prepared in these weeks ahead to feel and release a lot more deeper feeling. Make time every single day knowing that the planet is on this cusp of change that it's embroiled in right now. And the more humans who can populate the planet with that knowledge, not afraid, aware of that they have come here, volunteered and were chosen to be here now in the I am, to become the love, to commit to the greatest good of all. Then when worry goes away, when anxiety is quelled, the next challenge that you have is what are you going to do with that energy? And that is the second half of the equation. For you, for example, Linda, you've had your realization. You've started to let go of things you've wanted to let go of forever. And it's the product of everything that you've ever done, not just this moment, but in this moment, you found that power to let go and you're clearing. Now, what are you going to create? And part of being healthy and happy and thriving is not just setting an intention to be committed to the greatest good. That's the overarching religion, perhaps, that you do. What are you going to do with your energy and your time? Because you can't just sit around and read magazines. You can, if you'd like, just sit in your backyard in a chair, but the world needs you and your body needs to burn that energy that it had previously been burning through worry. Part of what worry and anxiety does, it keeps you trapped from acting. So when you pull away and you start to have these new processes and free yourself, you're going to have to find that inspiration inside to use that energy for something creative and good and whole. And we want to say that the creative process is not without conflict. So this isn't about removing all conflict and then just sitting around doing things that don't ever make you feel uncomfortable or deep feelings. That's coming till the day you die but it's the totality of your operating system and how it works that's going to dictate to, to, in your life, the quality of your life. And that's up to you. And you have that power. That is the good news. Even if you're struggling, even if you don't feel like you have control of anything, the truth is that you do. And we'll tell you, the moment of truth comes when you relinquish your ego. ego doesn't want to give up, but let it go. It wants to compartmentalize and judge and box and define. No, let go of your ego. Come in like a child and you open yourself up to the most 
amazing transformations. So with all that said, are there questions or conversation? This is Linda. I'd just like to thank you for all of this clarity and wisdom that you're giving me. It's an answer what I asked for wisdom and how to use the, this wisdom. So thank you very much. I'm very emotional at the moment. I just want you to know how very helpful this has been for me. Thank you. You are so very welcome. Always, always so welcome in this, these circles with us. As you've worked so hard in your life. You have. And now you're coming to a new age of Linda. This is true for many humans right now. The, the paradox that the world seems troubled and yet humans are able to unify and rise to an occasion much because some of the distress right now. So we're with you. This is Lynn and I'd like to say thank you as well. I am going to listen to this again. Thank you. The guidance is is so appreciated and I hope I'm ready for it. Thank you. You two are very, very welcome. And like Everyone who has been listening to our voice for however long, we feel that gratitude because humanity needs a light that cuts through all of the complexity that you're dealing with right now. And that light comes from within you. And we're here to be a reflection for you. We talk a lot about looking in the mirror, about 180 degree revolution back onto yourself. And we do that a lot with conflict because when you're in joy and when you're in happiness, you don't need resolution. You need to just be. But when you're in conflict, there are things that you can do to rearrange that, to come back into an inner peace and an inner harmony. This project, this mission this work is about to take a bigger turn. Keep yourselves focused on your intentions. If there was one thing you did in the course of a day, we would say it would be just to let go. And the second thing we would say would be to pay attention. And the third thing would be to watch and be amazed. One day he said he was weak.
Mama said, child, give it up, get the way. 